book on there. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. A day in the life of, oh. of, of <laughs> yeah, she'll be yeah. I'll do a little introduction to you. And Come on, it's a good idea. It is a good idea. Yeah. No I'll say things like, let's go to the top of page two. Yeah, yeah. 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 it'd be fun. Okay. First time for everything. Yeah. Not very long. Okay, I'm just long I'm six to get it. Okay, six oh, two. Oh, we might have to go. How to apply for I'm it. getting along. All right, let's call our meeting to order. Roll call shows all directors are present, no public hearing. We have a consent agenda. Anything to be pulled by directors? Yeah. What? Um, I had the 3.1.4, Okay. the yes. meeting minutes. Yes. And then the what's on tap. What's on tap. 3.2. Okay. Anything else to be pulled? No. no? I think I had a change to what was it? Three one two. Um, I think it one was. typo on that one. I There's one typo. Not, I decided not to pull it. Yeah, that. I think I think you've actually made. And the I, I made those change. The design one. So yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So exactly. fine, <laughs> it's done. Was I was like, <laughs> should I pull it for that? Thank for one you. S. Yeah. I haven't checked it. <laughs> okay, so we will pull those two. Anyone in the public yeah. wish to pull yeah, anything? Anyway, so. See no one. Anyone want to make a movement? I'll, yeah, sorry. I'll make a motion that we approve all of the remaining consent items. With the change already made to 312. Right. Okay. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. And so 314. Yeah, I had um, on page 58 of the packet, um, it's page four of the August 21st meeting minutes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Under reports 5.3, the quarterly organization-wide abbreviated status report um, under engineering. The third um, paragraph under Taj's section, it just didn't say what that was about. And I didn't know if anybody reading the minutes would know what we were talking about there answered question about isolating the zone for accepting water and noting that all three wells in the service area should be back online by November. I mean, it might, okay. I'm sure it's probably talking about O'Neill well, but it might say that okay. in the minutes. So um, that was all, it just wasn't, just wasn't clear what they were talking about there. Okay. And then I think I had a change to that one too. Ah, yes, on, on page 56, uh, it says motion passed unanimously, and yes. it didn't. It wasn't unanimous. <coughs> and the next uh, one was. Come on, get out of there. 57. 
Yeah, right. Should be additional. Right. Yes, I got that too. Okay. Anything else? I'll move approval of the minutes then. I will second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I think that's unanimous. All right, oral communications. So this is the time for anyone to so address us. The what's, what's on tap. tap. Oh, sorry, the what's on tap. You're right, correct. Okay, what's on tap. Yeah, sorry, that was me. Mm -hmm. um, on, it's page 65 of the agenda. I think it's the third page of the newsletter. Um, just, it's a long, I didn't know if that was too long about the finance of water, but that, whether people want to read the whole thing or not, I'll let, leave that up to them. But I just wondered if in that first paragraph, when it mentions the same thing that's highlighted on the lower right in kind of orange, it says independent financial consultants who specialize in rate setting are hired to develop our rates because of the financial and legal complexities involved in these calculations. I just think Somewhere in that first paragraph and also here th is the reason they, we hire somebody is not just because of the complexities, but because it needs to be fair and equitable for all, you know, there's, there's a fairness issue there and, and that also that we're not a profit, not for profit agency. So just to make clear while we're talking about rates that, that people know that we're, you know, a government agency, there's no profit involved and that and that we do these studies to make sure that they're, they're fair and represent the cost of, I mean, it says in the next paragraph about having to be related to cost of, of the production of water, but I just thought in that first one we ought to mention those, that's all. Let's see, I had something on that that I can't bring up at the moment. Oh, it's <laughs> it was, uh, oh, it was talking about the fact that, uh, it, it mentioned that, uh, we, uh, we're looking to, s to s see that the everyone couldn't use water at the same time. And of course, we don't design our system ever to make it be that everyone can turn on their taps and it ever works. What we aim for okay. is instead the, the, w the m most extreme day we've seen. So we need to handle that, not handling everyone turning on their taps at the same mm -hmm. time. Because mm -hmm. that would be way over what we actually need to do or, or do. Yeah, <coughs> the, the definition of peak flow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I didn't mention peak flows. But it was something like that. Well, yeah. Peaking also, peaking behavior. behavior. Right. Yeah. And also on page 54, 64, it uh, mentions the uh, this coming winter as part of our next phase of the five-year pilot project, and that makes it sound like we have still have five years to go, and instead we actually have two winters mm -hmm. to go because we've already used up three. Uh, that seems a little misleading. So. We'll modify that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we haven't uh, renewed that. So that's just, this is it. Right. You could just add, add a sentence that said there's two years left on yeah, that, exactly, on that exactly. five-year project. Right. On that five-year program. Okay. So I don't think that's a motion. I think that's, I just, think that's just feedback to staff. So um, I think we're done. Oral communications is next. Anyone wish to address us on any item not on tonight's agenda? This is the time. Seeing no one, any director comments? <laughs> Seeing none, we move on. Administrative board planning calendar 5.1. Yeah, and I'm glad to present on that. I didn't know if the board wanted to maybe go out of order. I was just thinking since we have Dr. Haddad here, his item is next, second to last. Sure. Sure, let's do that. Is that okay? I'm well, let's do six five. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll lead it off here. Uh, Dr. Haddad and a graduate student up at UCSC did an uh, economic study for the district. This spawned originally from um, a grant application we did. About a third of the points were based on the economic uh, study analysis. But before I hand it over and jump into it, um, I asked Dr. Haddad for. Um, some of his credentials and I'll just <laughs> you know Stanford Georgetown Berkeley 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 so that's the schools just to give you an idea Nah, eh, I've never heard of him he went from Georgetown <laughs> to Berkeley he told me that was quite a change I was just asking about that I think what's important when he did his postdoc or when he did his doctoral um, 
his, one of his major professors was Oliver Williamson, who was a Nobel Prize winner in uh, economics, economist. And then Richard Nor Norgat Gor Norgard, Norgard uh, founder of the International Society for Ecological Economics. So he, he's one of these rare birds that has the environmental and the business side, economic side down. Um, he wrote, uh, just to give you a sample, The Economics of Watershed Management, published by Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Environmental Sciences. Uh, there's several here. One he didn't put on the list, and one, is one of my favorites, is Rivers of Gold, which is basically a, a water market economics book for, for water that um, has been out for a while now. So thank you. Um, uh, yeah, so, and in addition to that, your student uh, is a uh, PhD in economics, is that correct? Yes, uh, Brian Pratt. Brian Pratt, very uh, rigorous, pr applying um, fundamental economics in a very rigorous way. And then on top of that, we had, uh, as a kind of a review, uh, our hydrologist, uh, Cameron Tana, who uh, has degrees from MIT and, and that sort of thing. But he also, and I'm mistaken, I says he has a graduate degree in economics from Stanford. It's only a... Uh, undergraduate degree from economics from Stanford, so I just want to correct that for the for the memo. But with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. And I uh, thank you um, uh, for, uh, for inviting me to participate in the grant application. Um, and can I just ask, uh, did any of you have a chance to look at the memo in advance? Oh, oh yeah. This is great. This, this board's good at that. We'll even tell you where, where there are any misspellings in it, and <laughs> commas missing. And well, well, this is great, because uh, in my undergraduate classes, I'm never sure of the answer to that question uh, when, when I begin my lectures. So why don't we start actually at the top of page two, um, and that's where you'll see that uh, um, we take as our baseline that the district will be in compliance with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. And that means that it will, uh, in the absence of any other project, be cutting back its pumping to 2,300 acre feet per year for several decades. Um, and we also uh, took that if this particular project, the uh, 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 Water Smart project, was not uh, built that the alternative project would be simply cutting back on pumping uh, and that there was not an alternative uh, structural project that had been advanced enough that we could use it as a comparison. Uh, so, um, so, that was, so that's our baseline. And then in terms of actually building the Water Smart project, yeah, pure water. Pure pure water. water. Uh, Water Smart is the, uh, the, grant. the grant name, the Pure Water Project. Thank you. Sure. Uh, in terms of um, build of estimating the benefits, we looked at four different categories: uh, benefits to residential customers, to commercial businesses, environmental benefits, and then outside of district benefits. So let's jump into residential benefits, and. I think the best place to start is on page three with the, the graph, because that will um, give us a, a sense of how we went about making this determination. Um, the first thing to do is start at that upper corner that's, that's where we see the intersection of 1,955 acre feet per year and $11,634. Um, and so that's, that's a f an important first point to look at. And then the second one is if you follow that curve down to the intersection of 3230 and $4,262. So what we show there, and I'll get in a minute I'll get to how we determine those points, is that if in, in our analysis of the behavior of, of res the water demand behavior of residents of the district, if the district were to only use price to drive down um, uh, consumption to 85% of that 2,300 um, 
acre, acre feet per year pumping limit. So the reason we say 85% is because 85% of the district customers are residential. And so that's where that 1955 comes from. If the district were to only use price, we estimate they'd have to charge $11,600 per acre foot. Another way of saying that is that that's how much the residents of the district value water um, or value this particular 1955th acre foot of, of purchase. And so, so that's basically our starting point. But now if the project gets built, we would be out closer to 3,800. In fact, we'd be at 85% of 3,800 acre feet, which is the 3,230. And we estimate there that the price would be 40 uh, to 62 per acre feet. And by price, it's not exactly like the price that the district is charging. It's the value that we believe our customers would place on the water at that point. And so at that point, what we say is, okay, here's the difference between no project up above and project down below. And anything underneath that demand curve, which is the sloping curve, is a benefit to the district. And you simply have to add that up um, for all the years of the, of the project and then take the discount rate, you know, d discount it back to present dollars. And that's how you uh, determine how much it's worth to the uh, um, residents. Yes. So by district, you don't mean the institution, you mean the population area. That's what I mean, the, the, the customers in the district. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and so that's, that's, the, uh, that's, that's the method that we used. But now the question is how do you arrive at, at these numbers? And we did that by starting with data that we had because we, um, have, we analyzed uh, the last couple years of, of demand data and pricing, and you'll see those, those interim, that, that, that interim uh, s uh, spot on the demand curve at 28, 26.25 and, and 5,500 dollars. And, th and that's from our data about the uh, amount of water demanded in 2016 by the, uh, the residential customers and the average price they paid. So that's actual data. And the next thing we did was we determined the shape of that demand curve. And we did that by looking at um, analyses of, of other water agencies, basically. And, and then we took some conservative, made some conservative assumptions. And we actually ended up uh, coming up with a, a very conservative estimate of what, of how we thought um, customers would react to a change in price. And the reason we, we went conservative is because it's, I would say at least in the literature, it's unprecedented to see a cutback as large as you, you see on this graph. Um, because typically you're, you're cutting back 10% or 15% or even as far as 25%, but you're never cutting back to the extent that the district uh, would have to cut back its pumping um, under the, the current circumstances. And so we decided to basically underestimate the, the response, and it, it meant curtailing the, the benefits, but it would also seem to us to be a conservative way um, to go. And so that's... Uh, um, so that's, and, and you can see on, I have that discussion of our, uh, of our demand elasticity at the bottom of page four. Um, and, and so, it's, it's a, let, let me just say that the city of Santa Cruz, when they do their estimates of their demand curves, they use negative 0 0.25, meaning a 1% increase in price will cause people to cut back on water um, a quarter of percent of their actual consumption. And we decided to go with 0.5%, which means that a 1% increase in price 
uh, means that the cutback is, uh, is half a percent. What that means is that uh, you actually don't have to raise the price as much as we would expect in Santa Cruz and elsewhere. Um, and that eventually leads to us having, um, estimating a lower amount of total benefits, but it's conservative and it's defensible. And so we decided to go with uh, uh, the 0.25%. Um, so. You mean zero, yep. zero point, minus 0 0.5. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, <laughs> minus 0 0.5. Thank you. Um, the, the next, oh, and, and, and all of that leads us um, to a benefit to residential customers if the project is built of $120 million in present dollars. Mm. Um, and so, and what we're talking about there is the residents would be willing to pay that extra $120 million for the water they're receiving, but because, uh, but it, it's it's a completely different question whether or not the uh, district would charge that extra 120, but they would be willing to pay an extra 120 million to go from the 2,300 acre feet per year to the 3,800 in pumping. So, so not having a project, they would lose that value then. Exactly. Okay. In fact, that's a good way to think about it: is that's the lost value if you don't do the project. The residential the loss value just to the residential sector. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a page or two in there that, that basically says that because the uh, district is not a profit-making entity, um, we've, it's basically neutral in terms of them as a beneficiary. If, if this were the private sector, then you would figure out the, the benefits to the supplier or the producer, but we, we said that th that would be neutral benefits to the uh, mm -hmm. uh, utility. Okay, so let's, there's, starting at the bottom of page six, we calculated something else that um, we weren't able to put into dollars, but I think it was important to point out that if, um, this project isn't built, and and the when we go with the uh, the expected uh, future without this project, one of the things that would stay in effect is a housing moratorium, and so we calculated the number of houses that would not be built um, in the absence of this project, and we came up at the top of page seven with the number twenty one hundred. Uh, additional housing units. And we uh, discussed uh, briefly that um, if, if anything is needed along the central coast, it's uh, additional housing. And this is a lost opportunity for uh, providing housing and, um, to, to the people who live in, the, in, in this area. Uh, so, um, and that's a, a little over 10% of the existing housing stock. Um, so that's that's the range of the uh, what what's what could be provided if if the project is built, but we didn't put a dollar value on that. Okay, let's turn to that next piece, which is the commercial benefits. And even though it's only fifteen percent of the uh, of the consumption of of the district, it turns out that commercial benefits are by far the largest source of benefits to our calculation. And the way we uh, generated them, if you go to page eight, about halfway down, um, there's a paragraph that starts uh, for the differences. And basically what we did is we said, let's take 2013 and 2016 as shoulder years around the drought and we'll calculate the economic growth during that period of time, and we will compare it to the 2014-2015 um, uh, major period of drought, 
and we'll look at the economic growth of 13 and 16 versus the economic growth of 14 and 15. And then if we find a difference, which we did, we will multiply that um, by the uh, by by the actual economic output of, of the uh, district and uh, and so one of the things uh, what well, well in, in in doing that one of the things we found was uh, well actually let, let me just say that we we eventually arrived at six hundred and seventy six million dollars because it was about a a 2% difference, as I recall, and I don't think we actually have that number in the, in the uh, paper, but the 2% difference times the outcome of, the, of this district, the, the economic output, um, then takes you to, uh, and then you do that until 2047 and discount it back. We then compared that to a different way of uh, estimating the uh, economic impact of the cutbacks. And it turns out that the alternative way gave us an even larger number. And so we went with the more conservative number, which was 676. The other way was there were some studies done um, in San Francisco by the PUC. And we took um, the San Francisco approach and uh, saw that um, it was, uh, they of course didn't, again, didn't go as extremely as we'd have to go in this situation facing <coughs> the district, but when we extrapolated, um, it, was, it was nearly the same number and we went with the more conservative of the two approaches. And so that's um, the, <coughs> so the bulk of the, of the benefits lies in the fact that businesses would be able to continue to function and grow and would not have to cut back um, due to a lack of water. There's another element to that which we again didn't quantify and that was an estimate of how many job losses there would be um, in the absence of the project and there we used a study of that East Bay Mud did and uh, we took their estimates of job losses based on water uh, lack of you know I guess drought is what they were looking at and uh, and we estimated uh, using their figures that s there would be roughly 725 job losses, which is about 3.8% of employment in the district. So, uh, but we didn't quantify what that means in terms of dollars, just the fact that there would be job losses, which I think we would all expect. Of course, that's economic too, because there's you know, salaries that we lost and then the, the leverage effects of they wouldn't be buying from stores if they don't have a the multiplier job. effects. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So turning now to environmental benefits, we looked at uh, we looked at it three different ways. We looked at the possibility of certain events occurring. We looked at the possibility of alternative scenarios uh, playing out and we also looked at um, some existence values of environmental benefits. So um, basically the, the source of environmental benefits is that the project itself more rapidly recharges the basin than the no project alternative. And, and you, you reach your uh, recovery point a little bit sooner. And so what we were looking at was that differential um, between the two projects. Because both projects, the, the project and the no project alternat alternative both recharged the basin. Only the project alternative um, could recharge the basin quicker. And so in comparing that to the no project alternative, it means that there's some extra water that is generated and it's basically stored. And that's how we thought about that is extra water available. And then we asked, in what instances would that extra water have value? And then how would you quantify that value? And so the first thing we thought was, well, there could be certain events where the district uh, would benefit from having that extra water. And 
the examples on page nine, there are three bullet points. Um, a massive drought beyond modeled expectations. Um, another is a, the possibility of a, of a chemical spill or what we call an anthropog anthropogenic spill um, that contaminates the aquifer. And then a third one would be a failure in a neighboring water system um, or a water intensive fire event that could be anywhere in the region that would demand, um, not necessarily demand, but it would prompt the district to share water. And if it had extra water, that would be extremely valuable under those circumstances. So that's, so those are events. Let's, we'll look at the table in a moment, but the next is alternative future scenarios. And that's just at the bottom of page 10 below the table. And what we see there are, it's possible that, so, so when, when modeling is done, there's a range of alternatives and eventually you settle on some midpoint that becomes the number you, you choose. And what we were asking ourselves were, well, what if we're beyond that midpoint? And what if um, we've simply underestimated certain impacts or it just hasn't been modeled um, in how it will actually turn out? And so the three scenarios uh, in that regard that we thought about were um, uh, there are climate change related reductions in the overall recharge of, of the groundwater. Um, and that uh, no, another one would be is there is the seawater intrusion along the coast going to be worse than we thought? Even, even with the recoveries in, in planned, we, d we just haven't modeled seawater intrusion as well as we, as, as well as it, it is in reality. And so, and the third one is that it's possible that we didn't model future demand properly and that future demand will actually be higher. And it could be, it, it could have been modeled properly, but it could be that the state says we are insisting on more housing, or it could be that there's some economic change that results in a uh, higher demand, you know, such as, you know, cannabis is, is water demanding and it could be a, a new crop that, that grows here in the district. So, uh, so things like that, just unexpected changes in demand. And so we thought about the scenarios. And then finally, in terms of existence values, the presence of extra water in the aquifer could provide three benefits and one is improvements in stream base flow, uh, which its very existence provides a value. And next is improved ecological function of springs and, uh, and streams uh, that result from the increased uh, uh, aquifer storage. And then finally, um, there's, it was in, in one of the uh, papers we, we wrote, we read, we, we, uh, we saw a discussion of a discussion of land subsidence as a possibility. And so we decided to, uh, to include that as a, as a possible uh, thing that can be avoided with, with additional water in the, in the ground. So now we can go back to that table and we'll give you an idea of how we, we uh, put, put those, um, s those events and scenarios um, to numbers. And so, in terms of the option value for these events, the three on top, we basically thought that for an extreme drought, that if there was a multi-year extreme drought, we would estimate that as a 0.25% uh, percent occurrence over that, over the 30 year period of the project. Um, and if that drought occurred, the district we estimated would benefit from having an extra 1,000 acre feet. And we also thought that in the instance of, a, of an extreme drought, multi-year, that the value of water at that point would be extremely high and we put it at 10 times the average value that we have today. And that's what that $55,000 per acre foot is, is a, 10 times more than the average price um, it, that people are, are paying now. That's how much they would value it. 
I'm not saying that's how much the district would charge for it. I'm saying that's how much it would be valued um, by, uh, um, by residents who, and, and businesses. And so you can basically do that same logic for, the, for all of the option values. Uh, and, and, that's ha and then if you, you run out the math, you, uh, you can uh, come up with a, a value for, for those benefits of having the extra water. Um, in terms of the alternative scenarios, meaning the future is just different than we have in our models, uh, if you look at the seawater intrusion risk reduction, this is actually the bulk of the, uh, of the environmental value, is trying to, by, by recharging the aquifer more rapidly, you're avoiding that risk and there is a positive value to avoiding that risk. And again, we said that the probability of that being the true scenario is 0.3, about 30%. And that the benefit of, oh, and the amount of additional water needed, if that's the actual future, would be an extra 200 acre feet per year. And then the benefit would again be 10 times the, uh, the current value of water. So, uh, so that's, and so that gives us, you can, you can do the math and, and come up with the value for that risk, for reducing the risk of seawater reduction. And then finally, um, in terms of the existence values, uh, we, we thought about what would uh, citizens of the district pay to have these uh, existence values protected or land subsidence avoided and we thought about um, that it would be, uh, on a per person basis, it would be small, but it would add up to about $55 per acre feet per year or $50 per acre feet per year. Um, and so when we do all of those calculations, um, what we end up with is uh, a benefit of $83 million. And that's on page 11. Um, just above outside of district benefits. Um, just, just to clarify something, if all of these benefits were exercised, it would be a little bit more than is being saved by the project. And that's why we, we actually said it, the existence values would be negative because you're actually drawing down the aquifer a bit in light of the droughts and the fires and the, the chemical spills and the things we thought could be in the future. So um, ultimately, we arrive at uh, $83 million as the benefit of that extra increment of water. And then finally, turning to outside of district benefits, um, there is a range of 16 to 685 acre feet per year. This is the bottom of page 11. Um, that could be available um, in the Red Sands aquifer. And so we thought about if that is available and if, um, out, if neighbors to the district utilize that water, what would it be worth to them? And so it, it presents a, a wide range. And so we selected um, 420 acre feet per year as an estimate. And then we uh, uh, took a, a very conservative value of $4,000 per acre foot. Um, and in, in part, we chose that 4,000 because we, we didn't know how that water would be used, what value would be put to, and the fact that it's a wide range to begin with. And so uh, based on that, we came up with a potential value of, of $24 million in benefits um, to uh, the southern neighbors of the district uh, from the project. So turning to the summary, uh, when you add up all of these uh, benefits, uh, residential, commercial, environmental, and non-district or outside of district, um, it adds up to $903 million. Uh, and uh, the costs, oh, I didn't really tell you how we estimated the costs. This, this was based on the Brown and Caldwell data that, that they did when uh, um, 
working on the project. They just gave us our their, their materials on what they estimated the cost would be, and we basically took the net present value. Um, and so that's an 8.6 benefit to cost ratio. I think one of the major take homes here is the how important it is for the district to take action on its, the district knows this, take action on, on the groundwater crisis that it has and um, the, the very large amount of benefits that would accrue to the, to the residents and, and to the businesses uh, and to the neighbors if that occurs. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to. Any questions or them. remarks? We got one. Okay. Uh, it was just a, it's just a, somewhat of a quibble. It was just that I wasn't sure that we should use the subsidence risk reduction for this district. Um, that has it really been a factor, uh, at least in current condition under current conditions. Well, I'll, 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 I had the mm -hmm. same question as you did. That's mm -hmm. why uh, we got Cameron on the phone because of the MGA recently. We said, well, we might be able to get it out of that as a mm -hmm. uh, sustainability indicator. But in conversation with Cameron, I think he recognized there is a small probability of, of that. Small probability? Mm -hmm. Well, we came across it in, s in the documentation. Oh, really? Yeah. And I can't remember where, but it was somewhere where there was a discussion of subsidence risk. And it seemed to be very small. And it also seemed that uh, the amount of additional water in the future that would be generated by the project would not have a very large effect on subsidence, even if it occurred. So small and then small again. Mm -hmm. And then we thought to ourselves, what would, what would a homeowner or a, or a building owner pay in insurance to avoid what could be a very expensive damage to their property that has a very low probability risk. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's, we, we were imagining someone would say, oh, 50 cents per year or or a dollar per year or something, but then that adds up because there are so many houses and buildings in the district. But it only adds up to about uh, 50, I think we had either 50 or $55 per 55. acre foot. Um, and so that's a, uh, um, yeah, fifty-five dollars per acre foot. And so that that was our our thinking about that. That even though it's, I I would say I, I agree with you that that is the the least likely of all scenarios uh, that we looked at, but it has a high impact if it occurs to the homeowner or the, the building owner. And so we decided to include it. Yeah, but um, but it's, it's like valued higher than stream base flow accelerated recovery, or you know, it just it, or it's given equal weight on some things that are, are kind of important to the district. So that that was my confusion. Okay. I think that it is it is uh, fair to to think about those values, and we we did our best to estimate them, but the. Um, to go further with it, you actually would do some surveys and 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 uh, ask people how they would value different scenarios, and then you can add those up to a, mm -hmm. a value for the district. But we thought that for what we were doing, um, that was a little bit uh, too much for us to do. Um, and well, I, un I understand that. Was, yeah, I had it, but. Um it's still, it was just some. Right, it, it, I understand. I mean, the other ones I see, the, you know, the climate change impact reduction, the seawater intrusion risk, and the buffer, you know, the buffer, because those are really things that are, you know, that are visible risks and important to act against in the district. But, um. These had, these uh, existence values had negligible impact mm -hmm. on the, outcome. In fact, as I mentioned, they actually lowered the benefits um, a, a little bit. Uh, but we, we thought it was important to include them. 
I looked at the same thing myself, and um, subsidence really occurs in certain aquifers where typically there's a lot of clay. Um, other things are, are structurally sound even if the water leaves them and don't have much. And the other thing is that living next to the ocean, if the water levels drop, salt water comes in and fills in. So, you know, we, we don't really have the kind of lowering of groundwater levels, you know, tens of feet, uh, you know, even per decade or per year sometimes that would lead to real subsidence. So I agree that, uh, it, of course, it's only a, a thousand times less than the seawater intrusion risk. So, <laughs> so I, actually, I, I would say subsidence risk really well, turns into sea, uh, yeah. seawater intrusion risk. Uh, mm -hmm. so anyway, you have one? Yeah, so I noticed that as well, mm -hmm. although your your ratio might go from 8.6 to, what, 8.5 or 8.8. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it actually goes up. I mean, that's the, the odd thing is yeah. that the existence values count only if the water is there, but to be consistent with the entire section on environmental benefits, mm -hmm. we assumed that all the other things happened and that extra water was all used up. Oh, okay. And so by the time all those other bad things happened, you were actually down a little bit um, compared to the baseline scenario. And so it dropped the net benefits by 1.5 million, which again, out of 903, it's not much. But um, if we were to have removed the existence values, the net value would actually have gone up a little bit. It's right, because of the way the math works out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the real big player here, residential is a big player, mm -hmm. but the real big player is commercial. Yeah. So I wanna make sure I understand that. So you use the shoulder years compared to the middle years during the drought because you're trying to um, basically remove a trend if there were some other, other factors causing a trend. And is that the standard way to do things? Yeah, it is a standard way um, to to get at this is to, um, and, and we just we happen to have the data and it and it worked well for for this region um, to look at uh, the two. Uh, well, they they weren't necessarily non-drought years, but there were less restrictions regionally on businesses in 13 and 16. And then there were heavier restrictions on 14 and 15. Um, and so that's why we, we set it up that way because the, the, business, the businesses actually didn't have as strict reduction mandates as they would um, in the scenario that's the uh, no project scenario. Right. So it would actually be worse um, than what we used. Okay, and then is, in thinking about benefits, so if the benefit is to the commercial, mm -hmm. is it fair to say that uh, they should be paying for more of this project than residential? Or is that a policy decision? Well, there's a Prop 218 um, discussion around that too. Well, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, and I'd have to give it some thought. It's ultimately a, a policy decision and it's, uh, but um, it is correct that um, it, you can see the ratio, it's about uh, six, six to one uh, in the difference in, in benefits. Uh, so, uh, but that would be, I'd say, up to the to the board to think about that. It's an interesting question. I can point out a couple things. Sure. Um, first of all, the, on the ratio, the, the project uh, is a positive, is greater than one on all three uh, areas. So the environment, it's, it's in itself worth it to just the environment, in itself worth it just to residential, and as you noted, um, several times worth it for, for the commercial sector. Regarding this, uh, very astute. Uh, we had a discussion around these three items and uh, 
Director Christensen, it, it was one of the questions, well, some people may value stream-based flow a little bit higher than the other, and a little bit of subjectivity in there, but, and then we went on about subsidence, uh, but the bottom line, I mean, I guess our guidance was, well, if it makes the estimate more conservative, let's, let's leave it in, we could, we could argue to the cows come home, but, you know, again, our guidance was do, as, do the most accurate, but be on the side of conservatism so we don't overestimate the project. And I, I believe they took that to heart. So, and we also have a, a graphic summary. I might pull that up. Uh, can you do that, Bill? Mm -hmm. Can I ask so, one more question before you leave the table? Okay, yeah, let's wait uh, before we get there. Sorry, just, I just wanted to make sure I, I, I don't understand under the seawater intrusion risk how the volume needed is 200 acre feet per year. How we, like, where did that come from, the 200? I estimated that. And I thought about, um, I, I simply thought about what kinds of demands are needed right along the coastline. Um, there are agricultural and, and other um, uh, demands and what would we need to satisfy some lost water demand along the coast. So I would say that's a, uh, that's a number I came up with, and, and you can see I didn't really distinguish it from the other two, um, but just a, a conservative estimate of what, um, how much additional water would be needed to try to preserve uh, the, the aquifers or, or, or work around the loss of them right along the coast. Another way to calculate that, we've estimated protective levels all along the coast, so this has to be so many feet above sea level and that has to be so many feet above sea level. And then we could look at how much water supply it would take to, to get some of that rise to happen. Um, that, would, that would work? That would be directly from our, our scheme. Of, uh, okay, that would be a good way to... Yeah. So some percentage of the overall 1,500 extra we need? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well, we have a summary graphic that we put together, the district did, just trying to encapsulate this. So um, when you look at the total economic benefit, it's about close to a billion dollars, 903 million, um, you know, a little over 100 million in residential, a little over 100 million in environmental, and the rest go into business. But again, total economic benefit. And then the things that weren't implicit uh, into that $903 mil million dollars are uh, these three little graphics here, which we've gone over, but it's just a way to summarize it. So the higher cost, cost to customers uh, without the project, if you did it just by pricing alone, which um, we, I don't think the board would necessarily do, but it gives you a reflection, it, the cost of water is about three times more than if you did it with a pure water project, $4,000 an acre foot versus twelve. And then, as Dr. Dodd went over, it uh, 725 job losses if you don't have the project, which is roughly, what is that, how, what percentage? About 4%, and then uh, less homes built, which is partly out of the urban water management plan. That's job losses over 20 years? Correct. So anyway, it's just a, a, a graphic just to help the layperson. Some of this uh, economic stuff is quite hard to understand, so we wanted to just extrapolate out the kind of the take-home points relative to our customers, and there it is. Anyone in the audience wish to address us on this item? Seeing no one? Okay. Thanks for doing this work. Yeah, thank you. It's very thank you. Really great. Yeah. It's really good, imp and I, I was going to just say, you know, we need to share this with the local officials. Right, right. We'll get it out to people <laughs> to see the value. Right. Okay, so let's go back. 5.1, uh, I think calendar. it was. 5.1. 5 5.1, 5 yeah. Okay, it's the board planning calendar. Yeah, so we're back on our winter schedule again. Uh, you know, two months we meet one one meeting per month. I think we actually upped that with some special yeah, board we meetings. Did. <laughs> <laughs> we probably exceeded what we were trying not to do. Um, and there, it's in September there'll be another MGA and GSP meeting coming up, 
And the only thing I, I did leave off on there on Monday the 10th at 3.30 p.m. at the district is another water right. rates advisory committee meeting. So if you're part of that, please take note. And That's 3.30 to 5. 3.30 to 5, yeah. While you're on that, so it says under the 20th, it says stakeholder meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's a different thing, I believe. It's not really a stakeholder meeting, is it? No, no, no. it's not. I'm not sure why I left that on there, but I did. Uh, let's just call it a mid county MGA meeting. Um, right. I just yep. I thank just you for catching sure that. People no, weren't I, confused. Yeah, because I'll copy and paste that. I think forever. it's a regular <laughs> regular meeting. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes yeah. we do have stakeholder meetings before the MGA meeting. Right. Right. Well, then there, there's the. I forget what they're called, not stakeholder meetings. There's another. The private wells. No, no. That's what I think of as the stakeholder meetings right. is where we have private well owners uh -huh. come. But they have the beforehand ability to come by and talk. Right, kind that's of different. Oh, the office hours type. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. well, this no, is just no. a regular old meeting. <laughs> right. Unless so it was the <laughs> actual <laughs> review the of the stakeholders meeting. issues at that meeting. No, I, I think I, I I think that's just a mistake by me. Yeah. Probably just a cut and paste thing. It's a board meeting. Yeah, it's just a board meeting. Melanie's pulled it up there, so we see that. Okay. Yeah. So nothing else to add, unless there's any questions on that. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to add that I I'll be out for the rate meeting on the tenth. On September eighteenth. No, the rates meeting on the tenth. Oh, oh, the tenth. The tenth. Okay. It is September tenth. It's not August 10th. September. It's not on there. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah, it yeah. should be. Okay. I forgot. It's a meeting day after this. Oh, the advisory committee. No, I heard that. I think it's written down on my calendar. <laughs> Any public comments? Right. <laughs> Any okay. public comments on this item? Seeing none. Okay. So really, four-hour meetings now for GSP? It could, yep. Hard work yep. is still to come. <laughs> Yep, Caffeine included. Four hours. <laughs> Intravenously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. They're long meetings, a lot, lot to get through, and a lot of turf to, to cover. Yeah. And a lot of people on the committee. Mr. Taj. Hi. We only have one will serve tonight. It's a, an ADU that is a, a conversion ADU in Capitola. Any questions? Any questions from the public? No one. Okay, I'll move approval. I'll second. We have a motion second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 I vote no. Thank you. That passes. 6 2, a resolution amending the district's conflict of interest code. Yes, this is a requirement every two years as part of the California government code. And we have to do it in even years, and anything that might uh, set off um, that we need to notify them about the conflict of interest. Uh, even if we don't, we need to tell them that nothing's happened. But in this last, over this last two years, Melanie Mal Schumacher um, was promoted to a position that, that makes that change necessary. So I think the motion is to have her, yeah, adopt that resolution and give us direction to submit the. Uh, work to the county. Okay. I'll make the motion. I'll second. We have a motion second. All in favor? Oh wait, roll uh, call. Roll call. <laughs> Director Lather? Good yes. Catch. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. President Daniels? Yes. Six three, amend ordinance 1801, superseding ordinance 1601. This is the second reading, I believe, for that. Right. It's nothing much. To add. Well, yeah, the, as, as Director Daniels mentioned, this is the second reading of um, Ordinance 1801 that would replace our Ordinance 1601. So I'm happy to answer any questions if you may have them. Any questions? Nope. Public? Yes. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner of Aptos. I just want to make it clear that this action is being taken as a result of um, legal action that one of your rate payers had to take in order to correct this, uh, the invalid rates. So I just want to make that clear for the record. It's due to a court action. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Seeing no one, back to the board. I'll move approval. I'll second. Okay, this needs to be a roll call vote as well. Director Lather? Yes. Director LaHue? Yes. Director Jaffe? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Dan. Unanimous, thank you. Okay, 6.4, Grantway Well Site Improvements. Reject bid, authorize staff to open, obtain proposals for company equipment, electric equipment, and rebid the project. Quite the title. Is that enough? <laughs> well, hopefully the memo is clear that we received only one bid. <clears throat> Despite extending the bid date and trying our best to advertise this project, it's a, it's a hard bidding climate right now. And the one bid we received, it was over budget by over $200,000. And um, we're recommending that we will rebid it um, with us, the district, procuring some of the equipment and piecing out some of the installation, the well pump, and buying the electrical cabinet and then rebidding that project um, in about a month or two. I'm pretty confident that we can make up the difference or, or more Good. and be maybe under our budget. I just have one question. How can an engineer's estimate for all other work be $10,000 and the bid be $140,000? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, we just don't understand. We asked them that because we thought, did we miss something? And um, they didn't really clarify. Okay. You know, they, they don't have to clarify that. No. Right. Oh, just we thought that was the miscellaneous little items, not $140,000 worth of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it's just due to somebody's uh, spreadsheet error. <laughs> well, it seems like a real logical way to proceed, so I'll make all, oh wait, public, right? Yes, anyone in the public wish to address us on this item? Seeing no one, Okay. there are I three I will suggested the motions. Three, the three I'll motions. I'll second. <laughs> yeah, we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's see, all in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay, so now we go on to a resolution, unfortunately, honoring the Depending on your point of view, of I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I, I assume the board president will want to read the resolution, but I'll just um, say on, on behalf of the management team and probably the board too, you know, this is one of those um, kind of mixed emotions, bittersweet things where you, you lose somebody that you, you hate to see go, but you see them taking a step in a direction that's better for them and full of good things in the future. So that's the sweet uh, part, but Karen surely will miss you. And thank you for all your, you know, high level of professionalism and diligence um, over these, I think, five years. And certainly your help to me as I came in and, um, and kind of showing me the way and teaching me what I needed to know. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, always super professional and organized and, and attention to detail really really appreciate it and how nice you are to all of us <laughs> yeah it made working up here a lot easier yeah uh, definitely gonna miss you but i especially appreciate the help you get you gave me in getting oriented to uh, four <laughs> years ago <laughs> thank you resolution number 1823 resolution of appreciation of karen reese executive assistant slash board clerk 2013 to 2018, the Board of Directors of the Soquel Creek Water District at its September 4th, 2018 meeting made the following findings, recitals. Whereas Karen Reese, Executive Assistant slash Board Clerk, is moving on after five years of outstanding professional service to the Soquel Creek Water District, and whereas Karen joined the district in June 2013 as the Executive Assistant slash Board Clerk to the general manager in the administration department and to the board of directors and whereas Karen lends a high level of professionalism and a keen sense of stewardship to the Soquel Creek Water District board meetings and public access slash re response responsibilities and whereas Karen's hawkish attention to detail, I like that <laughs> word, <laughs> and her focus on structure and consistency have contributed to several improvements toward efficient and effective administrative operations. And whereas Karen has demonstrated reliability as a key member of support to the district and to the board of directors and shall be missed by those who have benefited from her knowledge and warmed by her friendly smile. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved that we all join in extending our sincere and grateful appreciation for her dedicated service and our best wishes to her for continued success, happiness, and good health in the years to come. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I get to do my last roll call vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> somebody makes a motion. Yes. I make the motion. I'll second. And if I if I may ask, could could I get Karen just to stand up in front of the board and get a shot, Karen? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let's come on. Can I do it after they vote? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that attention oh, ever, to detail. Ever <laughs> officious. That's, that's hawkish, isn't it? We might forget it. Director Lather. Yes. Director like you. Yes. <laughs> Definitely yes. Director Christensen? Yes. Madam President, yes. Of course, yes. Karen, could you just stand by the How about if I stand back there? If I stand oh, back there. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. 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 Back here. That's better. I'll let you take one. With, okay, yeah, yeah. You take one without me. Yeah, yeah, then you guys don't have to sit down. I'm just reading my stomach as it should. Are they longer? Oh, they go half an hour. <laughs> Are we all in there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that was good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right, and we have one piece of uh, written communications and correspondence, 7.1. So, nothing to be done there, I think. No? Okay. Unless the and there's no closed session, and therefore we are adjourned. Oh, we'll we want to talk about it later. Okay. Good. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. Um, first of all, it appears that um, item 6.5, the economic study, was moved in the agenda. Uh -huh. We did that early, yeah, because he was here and okay. so we moved it. I came specifically for that, but it looked like it was later in the agenda, so I'm sorry I missed it. Um, if you want to talk about it, you can. Now. I would. Thank you. May I? You have three minutes to do Thank that. You. Sure. Thank you. I did want to do that because um, I read this, this study, and what bothers me is that on page one in the benefit analysis, um, it says that... Uh, there is no readily available feasible alternative to the district than to uh, move forward with pure water SoCal. And I think that's not true. Your district is moving forward with another feasible alternative. You, you, you have done the, the pipe studies, the, the water quality chemical studies, and have determined it's safe to accept water from the city of Santa Cruz, and you're going to be doing that this fall. The um, contract for that will be, I hope, renegotiated in 2020. And so that is a very near-term solution. So that the, um, the whole benefit analysis stating that it is predicated on the, the issue of not having any other choice is false. And I, I want to make that clear. I also take issue with um, some, a statement on page four um, when it's talking about price elasticity of demand. Um, this is in the last paragraph. It says that the calculations that this person has made seem to indicate, quote, meaning they, your ratepayers, value water consumption less than others. And if I were your ratepayer, I would be quite offended by this because your ratepayers have shown that they really do value water and they, they are very willing to do conservation. So, um, I want to use my last minute to speak to you about 
the communication that I sent you, and thank you, Director Daniels, for responding, because it involves the EIR, the draft EIR, and the late comment. <coughs> and um, again, I really feel that your district um, could have had a much better public face had you just given the public a little more time to explore and to learn about how to submit valid comments for your draft EIR. It would only have been another 15 days. And what is left is really no opportunity of any value for people to submit comment. As your response has said, there, there really is no point because it will not be addressed in the final EIR. It will have no legal um, merit and would really be meaningless. And that's thank you. a little bit difficult to hear. But thank you for providing that clarification. Thank you. So I think we're all done now, unless someone else has something to say. So I believe we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Take care, kids. Almost a world's record. We got